Okay. Hello, everyone. This is that fun 30 second delay time where I just blather on waiting to see if I'm actually live because of the crazy delay. And once I find it, I will kill the volume. So hold on, waiting. Okay, there it is. It showed up, killing the volume over here. Okay. Hello. So you know the routine. Pop onto the chat when you're here because I never really feel like I'm here until you're here. That's just one of those crazy things. Um, so even though, I, even though I'm pretty sure I'm live, there's Susan, hello from Washington. It's just, I never feel like I'm here until you guys are here. So hello, welcome. Um, I'm so excited. It's finally cooled off like a little bit here in New York that I can wear a little sweater. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Anne. Folks are coming in. Um, so as always, I will put in the show notes, what is Patty wearing? So you don't have to ask. It's the cable rib sweater. It's going in the notes. Um, I don't know why I put my knitting away. I need to keep knitting because because I got to get the fall video sweater class. Hello from Arizona. Hello from Southern Illinois, Oklahoma, uh, West Michigan, mid coast of Maine. <laughs> That makes me a little sad because, you know, that's where Affinity was going to be live, but now it's going to be on the internet and it's still going to be awesome. But, you know, hello from Denmark, Ooh, from Richmond, Virginia. Okay. You guys are coming in from all over the place. Um, hi, welcome. As always, it's so incredibly nice that you would take a little time out of your day to hang out with me. Um, and, you know, I've started bringing in friends. I have to get this, oh, it's like a weird, oh, there it is. There was this weird pop-up that was right over my face that was bugging me. Um, hello from Atlanta, from Maryland, from New Mexico. Okay, let's see. Where, we had Brazil in the house last week, I think. I'm trying to remember. Um, anyway, hello to everyone. Last week was the first week I decided to be semi-professional because, you know, I've just been kicking it like so casually without really doing those things you're supposed to do. So here goes, here's those professional things you're supposed to do, which is to say, I hope you like this video. If you do, if you like hanging out with me, give me that little thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button because that way you get notifications of my next live and my next guest, um, which I have to check the calendar. I'm pretty sure my next guest is Kate Atherley. Um, she's one of the teachers from Virtual Affinity. Um, hello from, can't hear me. Rebecca can't hear me. Rebecca, are you the only one who can't hear me? Um, hmm. Rebecca, so someone else tell me if, you, if the rest of you can hear me. Although I would assume that there would be like a million of you saying, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. So I'm hoping that it's just Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, if you can't hear me, don't forget to, you know, check the volume on YouTube itself. So in addition to the volume on your computer, there's volume on YouTube. So um, someone give me a, okay, okay, everyone else can hear. Okay, yay. Remember the dark days of quarantine number one when like everything went wrong at all times? Actually, the dark days of quarantine number one, two, three, I'm pretty sure four. Like it was, it was just one technical horror show after another. Um, but anyway, blah, 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 click subscribe. Then you get a notification, yada, yada, yada. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about uh, before I forget and before I introduce our special guest, because once I get a guest in, I get excited and then I forget to tell you things. Um, I'm probably going to send out like a, 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 another email about this. I normally only send out a newsletter once a month. Um, but when I sent out the last newsletter, that was to tell you that virtual affinity registration had opened. So I couldn't include the next little bit of news in that same email. So the next bit of news is this. When I put virtual affinity on sale, I sold everything but one package. I reserved one mini skein um, that I did not put up for sale so that I could present 
the Virtual Affinity Scholarship. So if you go to my website, pattylyons.com, you'll see it right there on the homepage. And I am gonna put a link to it this in the show notes. But the idea of it is this. I'm trying to, I'm trying to see all the positive things that are coming out of this crazy world that we call COVID land. Um, and obviously you all know I've been teaching virtually a lot. And although I miss you and I miss seeing your knitting in person, it, it's becoming really evident how many pros there are to teaching virtually. Um, like I've had people in class from Japan and Brazil and Australia and Scotland, um, from the UK, uh, from Amsterdam, uh, just from everywhere. Um, and I've had a lot of interesting emails, people saying to me that they've never come to Vogue Knitting Live because fill in the blank. Uh, one email said, I really can't, I, I, you know, I just don't want to, I don't like to travel. It's very difficult for me. Um, it's really loud. It's really crowded. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I live in a small town. New York City is like not my vibe. So, and, and there've been other reasons. So I wrote a, a blog explaining, oh, hello from Germany, explaining what the Virtual Affinity Scholarship was all about. So you can nominate a friend or you can nominate yourself. But what I'm hoping is that because there are so many barriers to attending an event live, and those barriers could be accessibility issues, making travel difficult. It could be budgetary, right? It could be um, a variety of reasons that might make you feel that you're not comfortable or that you're nervous that you wouldn't be comfortable going to your fir very first knitting event. And whether that's, you know, race, sexual identity, um, sensitivity to, to noise, to crowds, to light, um, you know, prone to migraines. Uh, there's a million reasons that you might not have ever attended a knitting event. So what I'd love for you all to start thinking about is do you know someone that has never attended a knitting event that this would be perfect for? Um, and if so, please go to pattylines.com and click on that link to Virtual Affinity Scholarship and everything's taken care of um, for the person that wins. They'll get the goodie bag delivered to their house that includes the web camera, um, the whole package is paid for, it's gonna be great. So anyway, that's what I want to say. But enough about me, I have a special guest. So this is a, a dear, dear friend of mine who, for those of you who've taken my Build a Better Fabric Perfect Your Knitting class, I mention every, every, every single time I teach that class. Um, he is truly one of a kind. I can't think of anyone else in our industry that's doing what he does. Um, he's a physical therapist that also knits and realized that there's a lot of injuries out there that affect knitters. And here he thought like, I can combine my two lives and make this work. Now I'm really nervous about saying his last name because I've mispronounced it my whole life. Um, I could just say Carson, but Carson, turn on your camera and come in. I've always mispronounced it. So Carson's going to help me. It is not the emphasis on the, see, now I've screwed it up already. Now I'm so nervous. No, just say it. You should just try. You'll be fine. Okay. Okay. Well, here, here's, here's how I can do it. I'll say, here's how I said it for years. Demers, which is wrong. That's the, the emphasis on the wrong syllable. It's Demers. <gasps> did I do it? You did it. You know, oh, you know how I can remember it for, for all my life? Huh? Because when you and I are together in a bar, having a cocktail, neither one of us is particular, particularly demure. 
But then you're gonna say you're you're gonna make no, no, no. It's just the, it's just the just the um the like the musicality of it, the okay. rhythm of that word. Okay. Oh my god. So wait, I have to catch up. There's hello from Massachusetts, from Michigan, from Germany, from the Netherlands, from Connecticut, from North Carolina. Oh, and Charlotte says, welcome, Carson. Hi, hello, Charlotte. Oregon. So folks come from all over. How cool is that? I'm a Massachusetts boy. You are. I know. Where's I was gonna I was gonna say, tell us where you're from, but you know, but now yeah. you're just... now I just but and, that's and, not where I am. And you're yeah, where and where are you? I Do am in your address. <laughs> I'm in beautiful, foggy San Francisco. Oh. It's where it's always sweater weather, except for two days out of the year. I know. What What was the thing? What was the? Oh, I always forget the famous quote about. Um, the The coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. Is that Mark Twain or is that apocryphal? Uh, it's Mark Twain. Is oh, okay. who I've heard attributed. Okay. Yeah. Because um, but you know we call. We call it foggus, we call it June gloom, we call it, you know, the July, whatever, I don't know. But basically it's, you can always tell when we have um, tourists because they're the ones in the shorts and the tank tops in the summer and they're freezing their butts off. Okay, except I, I'm going to say this about that. You know, I lived there for almost a year, right? Because I was, I was there, um, I lived there twice. I was, I was there uh, back in my old life when I was a stage manager. I did White Christmas there at the Orpheum. And then I was there for almost a year doing Jersey Boys at the Kern. People that live in San Francisco dress in every different way because of the crazy microclimates. Yeah. So you can look at, like in a normal city, you can look out your window to see, oh, I want, how are people dressed, right? In San Francisco, you could look out your window and go, oh, the, okay, long pants and a parka. Oh, okay. Like- Yeah, um, there's that's Bernal Heights represented because it's hot over there and that person's wearing shorts, but I'm up in Twin Peaks and we're all wearing parkas and sweaters. And right, or like, I'm from here, but I'm, I'm, going to the, I'm going to work here. But the microclimates are wackadoo. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's true. crazy. And as soon, the curious thing is, as soon as you cross a bridge, it doesn't matter which bridge, like everything changes. And it's just normal weather there. Like it's normal summer across the bridge. Yeah. And the first time I went up um, uh, uh, to Coit Towers, when I, the first time I ever visited the city, when I wanted to, to see the murals inside the towers, you know, oh, the, yes. um, uh -huh. the, uh -huh. the Rivera murals, you've gone, yeah. haven't you? Sure. Okay. You, 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 you made me nervous. Like you were low. No, 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 no. So the first time I, you know, you go, you go up and up and up and up and up and up and up. So no one told me to pay attention to the time of day. So I got there right as the fog rolled in and I'm like, holy mother. I can't like, I couldn't see the hand in front of my face. Yes, yes, you, you have to be careful, you know, and, and depending on the time of the year, because like in the summer, the fog, it's here in the morning and then it clears out like where I live, it's still foggy at this hour and I think it's after 11. Um, and then it's back at three. So it'll, we'll have like two hours right. where I live. And then it's back at three and then it goes away around seven. So you can grill outside at seven o'clock and you know, you, then you're good till morning again. It it's is crazy. crazy. Yeah. Um, we have, oh, hi from over the bridge, says Anne. Hi, Anne. <laughs> hi from Oklahoma City, from Tahoe, California. Uh, Emily says, Arg, I'm late. Sorry. Hello from Spain. No worries. Um, so I was just explaining to folks how I mention you every time I teach my class. Thank Build you Data for Fabric. doing that. Well, and so the, the interesting thing is, and I'm not even sure, I think I told you this once. But when I'm talking about, because um, I really try to de-emphasize speed, that's not my goal, right? That's not my goal. My goal isn't about fast, fast, fast. I always say like speed will come when you find the form that is correct for you, that is correct for the combination of yarn and needles and 
um, that is efficient and then speed will naturally come. But if you start by chasing the goal of speed, you won't get there. You have yeah. to start by actually going in crazy slow motion to break your muscle memory and carve new neural pathways. And I tell the story about the first time I got your book and how I was really nervous as I flipped the pages, getting to the picture. Cause the, like pictures of knitting aren't right at the beginning. Like right at the beginning, you have to, you lay a lot of groundwork. You talk about musculature. There's a lot of like pictures of tendons and stuff. But not in but a scary I, way. <laughs> but I got nervous. Like I tell, I say in the class, I'm turning the page going, please let him be teaching knitting the way I teach, please let, not because like, I want you to agree with me, but I wanted to know that like the way I teach for creating a perfect stitch was also, and of course it is because form follows function. So like the photo of your finger holding the yarn, the photo of continental, that's like, it could be a photo of my hand, except your hands are nicer. Probably not, but, <laughs> and you're right, the form, you know, it does, it does follow function. And so many of us like learn this kind of, you know, we don't sit at grandma's knee in the Netherlands anymore and learn continental knitting. We sort of learn it through YouTube videos and God knows where people have learned it and all the changes that happened still in our pictures technique. in a book. I'm sorry. Harder. Like still pictures in a book. Oh, that so hard. So hard. Oh my so God. So hard. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube has definitely made it easier to follow somebody's um, example. But, you know, even that, we, we pick up we pick up techniques that are not traditional. And honestly, it's the traditional stuff. It, it, knitting worked for a reason. And when we moved our textile industry into factories and stopped, you know, hand knitting as much, we lost a lot of that. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad that you, thank you for mentioning me in your class. I and always I do. We're on the, we, you know we're on the same page about our knitting technique stuff though, right? Yeah. Like I, it's not about, for me also, it's not about speed. It's really more about, um, you know, get, get the form down. And it, it's exactly as you say, the speed will just happen, but, but many of us have these habits that actually slow us down and introduce risk into our knitting. And so that's really what the book is about. So um, I just got this weird pop up too. I hope you can't see that when it pops up. Oh no, 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 I can't. Okay, all right, oh, good. Oh, I'm really new to this. You, guys, I'm really new to this whole like digital YouTube. Like, what? There's this. One of this the things that I, I teach in the in the um, and I said this when I was talking to Steph, although I didn't out her for this one particular story, but when I do the teacher training for for Vogue, and I say like, you know turn off your notifications and on your desktop, it's not gonna bother anyone. Like if you see a pop-up, only you see it. But if you happen to be using your iPad or your iPhone as a camera or like playing videos off it and you forget, it's showing you exactly what's on your screen. So then like the text from your mother saying like, why don't you ever call me? That will get projected into the world. Oh, you did not give me that heads up. I hope that I don't get any of that. Can I, I'm gonna, can I tell you a funny story? Okay. It's actually a little embarrassing, but you know, it's the 2000s and um, we shop online. And so I needed, this was not during COVID, it was before, I needed underwear. So I was shopping for underwear online and at home. No big deal, right? But, um, huh? Yeah, online. I was buying underwear. Okay. Yeah, I hate going shopping. Me too. Except for, you know, fleece and fluff and stuff. Anyway. I was, I was using probably like Chrome or something. I don't know what, what the browser is. And when I got to work, we had the same browser. And those like male underwear ads kept popping up like every single day on my work computer. I was Oh mortified. my God. I was mortified. That That is bad. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Have you seen um, on Twitter and on Facebook now, this kills me. The way um, they're they're trying to couch you agreeing to having your information shared as if it's a good thing. They say, would you like to see more relevant ads or would you like to continue to see irrelevant ads? And I'm like, irrelevant ads, please. Mm -hmm. Because yep. I'm like, not an idiot. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, that is good. Oh, yeah. I'm. Oh, Karen, Karen said, I've wanted to get his book for a while. What's stopping you? Oh, and Emily said, I really need to get that book. Well, yeah, what's stopping you, girls? Okay, yeah. Oh, so Renee said, <laughs> so Renee, Renee just said, that's what Amazon's for. Uh, actually, no. oh, wait, no, no. She says, oh, bought underwear and groceries. Yeah, because I had an embarrassing Amazon moment with your book. So it wasn't me. Um, I give my, I have a team that helps me, the lovely Nai Chen and Zanti that help me with Twitter and Facebook. I run my own Instagram account, but they help me with Twitter and Facebook. And so they have the list they have, we meet once a month and we talk about things that we want to talk about and people that we want to support. And they have my, the list of like my, my peeps that I want them to continue to like weave in from time to time, like give a mention. So a post went up on my Facebook page, um, I think a couple of days ago. And it was weird because it was unrelated to the fact that you were scheduled because Nai Chen didn't know you were scheduled back when she put this post up, just like a normal promo for your book. And she just grabbed the link off Amazon. Oh no. So do you know what your book is selling for on Amazon right now? I do. <laughs> what? I do in the world. So people were like flipping out in the comments and I, I kept have, I kept posting your website, like, sorry, go here. Sorry, go here. Sorry, go here. Yeah, someone just saw it. It's $695 on And Amazon. that's actually, that's actually a price reduction. It's been as high as $3,000. And there were, there were three merchants on Amazon. Um, gosh, it was right before the second printing. And I think I had announced that the book was going into the second printing. And somehow a merchant understood that to mean that the book was out of print. And so I emailed these merchants and I, and you know, forget, I can't, I can't get a real life person at Amazon for anything, but um, I tried. And I said, why on earth are you doing this? It's, it's ridiculous. And honestly, it hurts my book sales, right? Because people think, well, who's gonna spend $3,000 on a stupid book, right? I mean, it's not, it's not fact that it's not worth $3,000. Maybe it is, but you shouldn't spend that much money. Anyway, apparently Amazon has this algorithm where if, if your book was ever for sale on Amazon and then it goes out of print, it's, it's a, there's an open, it's like an open, they can price it any way that they want to price it, any way that they want to do it. And, and so the merchants that the ones that bothered to reply said, you know, we're sorry, but this is the price that, that Amazon is generating based on the fact that your book is, you know, had high demand and, was, and is out of print. There was a person that, um, that was selling it on Amazon and then she stopped. But I should tell, I should say this to you, Patty, and to the listeners and watchers, but I intentionally didn't sell on Amazon, not because of any, anything against Amazon, but I really want to support the local yarn shops. Right. So I had a feeling that my book was going to be, um, was going to sell well, and it's doing pretty well. It's going into our fourth printing, actually being printed as we speak. For I didn't know that. Yeah, isn't that cool? Very exciting. I, mean, I knew. I knew so you guys, if you're hearing that, there are no more books. That is not true. You can get them from me. Well, I know, I know. I I did put yeah. your link about a million times. No, no, no. But um, my point is that I really wanted, I saw so you won't find it on Amazon. I'm not, I don't plan to sell on Amazon. Um, partly because just for me, it, 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 it ends up costing me a lot more to sell on Amazon right. than if I just do it myself. So that's, but I just do it myself. It's easier. So I'm wondering um, if you're, if $3,000 beats the record for, um, the, the principles of knitting, which got really out of control at once. So what was the most expensive book you've ever, like how much have you paid for a knitting book? And I would love to know what people that are watching, what's the most you've ever paid for a knitting book? Like a vintage book or an out of print book? Because I have to say, I haven't spent $3,000, but I've spent a lot, a lot. Like I'm I mean, I've never, found, I, I've never found like an out of print book that I've been hunting for. Did you, so like, what did you find that, had you been on the hunt for something and then you tracked it down? Yeah, I do this all the time. It's like a little, it's like a little um, guilty pleasure. I love hunting for books. So let me see. I do this a lot. 
I got um, a first, uh, the first, I'm looking at it right now, the first um, edition, edition, not edition, but the first, not the revised one, but the original principles of knitting. And I think I paid, and this was probably more than 10 years ago, probably 11 years ago or so. And I didn't know that, um, I didn't know that she was redoing it, that June was redoing it. So I, I paid like, I don't know, $300 because I really wanted it. Because I, 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 I think, I mean, I've heard that, that like eight, 900 was kind of a normal price for that. For yeah, while. so when I saw 300, I thought it was a good deal, right? And I didn't mind eating Cheerios for a month, but um, so I could have the book. And it turned, I was a little bit disappointed. I mean, the book is, is the content is great, but it was, um, it was a library book from an Air Force library. How specific is that? Isn't that interesting? Wow. But I'll tell you, this is a, can I tell you another? Cause I, I told you, like, like, this is a little guilty pleasure. I love book hunting. So I was traveling, my mom came out to visit me from Massachusetts and we were traveling through the Redwood. We went to this beautiful little town um, it's called Ferndale. And if you haven't been to Ferndale, it's a really, it's just this charming little, don't blink, you'll miss it, but it's very agricultural. And the downtown is this old Victorian, absolutely beautiful. And there, in Ferndale, it was this tiny little, like, um, we used to call them five and dimes where I grew up. It's like a little, like a little variety store, but it had a knitting section in it. And it was mostly the knitting section in it. And um, absolutely charming owner. And she had on her shelf, so this would have been, again, probably 12 years ago, she had um, Alice Starmore's um, uh, Fair Isle book in the original plastic wrapper that she got it in at the original price it was like $24 and online it was like a thousand dollars and I said I totally have to have this book but how much is it and she said well look at the sticker and I said yeah but you know how much this book is worth and she said I bought it for to sell it at this price and you can get it at this price so I did see I've never uh, I know that there are you know websites that you can search for something but that to me isn't isn't fun the fun is uh, the like actually discovering it the way you did so i've never specifically like searched on um the internet for for places that were book resellers but what i do always do whenever i'm in a, a antique store that has some books or in a used bookstore i just sort of fantasize about like just stumbling across like a first edition elizabeth zimmerman if i that the more than Starmore, if I found a first edition uh, for easy, I would get that. That oh, would be sure. that would be my treat. Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, Allie said I'd pay three thousand dollars. It saved me from surgery. Oh my goodness, Allie! What you didn't really pay three thousand dollars? No, she said I. I, 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 I would. Cousin, I would have. Yeah. Um, oh, and someone else said. Uh, uh, 75 is the most for me that I've ever found, but I haven't found a vintage knitting one yet. Okay. Um, oh, I have absolutely no chance to purchase the book in Europe. Yes, you do. Contact with Carson. Friends wanted to bring it when they came, but then Corona. Okay, so let me tell you, um, since before the book was born, I have been looking for, well, so you guys should know that. So first of all, you know, it's an independent book. It, it, I published it myself. It's an indie book. It's not represented by a big book company. Um, and so distribution, you kind of have to have um, a distributor to get it where it needs to be and all the places it needs to be. And at the time I was writing the book, there was a company called Unicorn. And some of you probably still remember Unicorn. Oh, yeah. And then just as my book was coming out, because they were going to represent it, they closed. So suddenly I needed to learn distribution as well as all the rest wow. of this. Everything um, when it, went under. everything you know and it's a big fat book it weighs three pounds it's hardcover it's like heavy beautiful paper and there's like close to 300 pages so it's a it's a it's a volume right right um so i've now got i'm so excited I, there is a shop now in amsterdam that oh. is carrying my book oh wait, wait, wait. okay so so um where's that comment ah I have to scroll back to find who, um, I don't know where the commenter lives, 
but if they're anywhere in anywhere in Europe or the UK, and what's the I've name been, of the shop? It's the App Staff, D E capital A P A P S T A F. Do you have a listing on your website or links on your website of? Uh, I don't summer? know if I do, but I can. I can. Um, I really should do that. Yeah, you I should, should at least have a like. If you're a European buyer, click here to find a shop. Yeah. Yeah, I should do that. Um, there, there are sellers in Canada. Indigo Dragonfly carries my book in Canada, and really, really, really happy to tell you that I now have somebody in New Zealand carrying my book. So those of you who are in Australia or New Zealand wow. or anywhere down under, um, it's got to be cheaper to ship from there than it is to ship from here. So it's Minerva is the store and they have a website. They, they, I love that they have, um, Patty, you should check out their website. They have great textile books. So I'm really, oh, I'm cool. really thrilled to be um, in, in their lineup. Yeah. Oh, and Rachel just bought your book. Um, Thanks, Rachel. Sandra said, I found a, what? Sandra said, I found a first edition Uncle Tom's Cabin for a dollar. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh my gosh. I, I have no idea how much that's worth. Oh, way more than a dollar. <laughs> wow. You should go to the Antiques Roadshow, right? You'd, you'd be that person oh. that. There's the, uh, the, the, um, uh, she says, thanks a lot. Amsterdam is no problem. Woohoo! Excellent. Woo Yay. Yay. Now I yeah, really want to know the three thousand dollars that the I'd pay three. Oh, there she is, Allie. Um, what surgery you would have saved her from? So Allie, let us know whether it was uh, you know, what the issue was. Was it shoulder, elbow, wrist? You know, you know me, Carson. I'm now very interested in people's um elbows. Yes, That's I know you are. Great interest to me. Can I just say one more thing about about books you can um, say being hard to get outside two, of the U.S. Two so, more um, what I what, you know what I started to say earlier is I really wanted this book in yarn shops, and I know that yarn shops are having a hard time right now, and I get that. But a lot of yarn shops have um, online shops and online sales now. So, talk to your yarn shop owners, folks. Um, I have talked until I'm blue in the face. Um, across the UK, and unfortunately, I don't, don't know a lot of shops um, on the continent in Europe. But talk to your yarn shops; they get a hefty wholesale discount, and um, it would be nice to have it there. And would like be nice to save people postage. And it's not about honestly. My whole intention for writing this book, and I, um, I hope they, I'm sure Patty knows this, but I hope you guys know it too. I don't want you getting hurt because I I got hurt. I learned about ergonomics because I got hurt using a computer, and I. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't treat patients. I couldn't knit. Uh, I couldn't fold laundry, which I didn't mind not being able to do. But um, you know, it's just it's just the worst, and, and it's so completely preventable. So yeah. And the funny thing is, is my Carson setup, which I have here, um, is now very handy for teaching online because this laptop is up on my stand that I bought because you mentioned that um, to get the screen where I need to, it to be, I would have to do that. So that's not gonna work. So then external keyboard, external trackpad, right? And so all of those things are things that I use all the time now that I'm teaching virtually because like, especially the trackpad because I can be far away from the screen and be you know, doing my controls, I can be typing in the chat. So my Carson setup has been very handy. I'm so glad to hear that. This I have a blog post that, what's that? So the other oh. Carson thing that's knitting related is about standing. So this is my, my Carson bag because this is where I can clip this to my belt loop. And so I do rotate um, knitting sitting and knitting standing. Those are all my such a good student. She's so trainable. I know. I, well, and the I don't have the book here, but it's in when I it's in Brooklyn, and I have my post its on um, my the exercises that I like to do. Oh my god, I'm so oh. not catching up with comments. Okay, you talk for a second. I'm going to catch up with comments because there's a, like a million that came in. Oh wow. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that I I can um, share with you is that 
you know, the, there's a lot of information in the book and it can seem a little bit overwhelming, but you honestly, and Patty, you can attest to this, yeah, you I might not even have to make a change in your knitting. Like making a change in the way that you're using your computer can make you a more comfortable knitter. So it's, it's all connected because it's all the same tool, right? So take off the stress of your tissue when you're using your laptop. And there you go. There's this is another, another I forgot tool. this is another Carson setup. Like I literally changed my whole office. This is my foot stand because you people of my height, so that's like a little change that was a big deal. To, yeah. To get the angle of my leg correct, um, I had to raise my chair. Now I raised my chair. I needed a footstool. There you go. Easy peasy. See? I have a blog post that I hope to get up this weekend. Um about saving your neck. So you can, you guys can go to my website and uh, I, I hope I have it up on Saturday or Sunday. I, I, it's a crazy work week, but- um, Is it about Saturday this or, or about that? It's about everything. I'm not gonna tell you, I want you to read the blog post. Cause I did have, um, oh, is someone saying what's your uh, website? Well, I can put it on, I'll put it in the link, but um, just say it out it's, loud. It's um, ergo I knit, E R G O I K N I T, ergo I knit.com. And I'm going to put it and in. You can get the book there. And my blog is my poor little anemic blog, which I, I posted. You know, it's because of now that we're, now that I'm sheltered in place at home, I'm, I started to blog it, but it's been three years. Since I, <laughs> it's embarrassing, but uh, it's there and I'll start again. I actually want to start doing more like video stuff. Patty is the expert. You guys already know this. Patty is like so ridiculously savvy with like the tech stuff. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. And you think, you know, I know how you can get hurt from it, but I can't tell you how to work it. Like I can't. Wouldn't I love to do, I would love to have like a little Instagram, I mean, a little YouTube talk like this all on my own, like with my, with, with my neighbors too. And I don't know how to do that. So Patty, you should, I don't well, know, when this is over, let's go out for drink and teach. Totally. And I'm going to send you a link to my friend's Instagram account as an example of what you need to be doing. Um, because her, her name is Zena Dalla, and she um, specializes in eliminating neck and back pain. And she does these little tiny, um, I'm going to turn my airplane mode off. But she does on her Instagram grid, these teeny tiny short videos. Um, and of course she, I mean, it's obviously to get people excited about, you know, what she does because she um, does one-on-one -on -one coaching through the internet now that she can't um, go to people. But, you know, like little tiny, little tiny videos. That's so wonderful. you should be doing that. Little, yeah, little there's snippet. so many things I should be doing, honestly. <laughs> you know what I'm doing? Because I feel like um, I'm not very organized. Like I'm not a good organizer, but I always, and and I'm incredibly distractible. So I'm that dog in Up that like, you know, sees the squirrel and I go off in another direction. That's kind of me. I If I, I could turn this camp, which I can do, but I won't. If I turn the camera around, you'd see like a million projects that are all in various forms of incompletion. They get done, but it's just like, you know, distractible. So anyway, the point is I'm doing a, um, a an online class about bullet journaling to learn how to be more organized. And it's being taught by the fabulous Felicity Ford, Knit Sonic. My friend Janine, Feral Knitter, is doing the class. We're sort of doing it together and um, it's fabulous. So. It's helping, it's going to help me to keep like all my ducks in a row because there's just too many things on the table, right? Like, you know, the new book and the online classes. I'm sorry, the what? The what? There may be a new book in the works. Well, I, I'm sorry. Why you, were you just gonna like slide that in and expect me not to hear? I, <laughs> I, I hadn't really. Um, were you not supposed to say that out loud? Oh, I was shoot. Not okay. So, um, you guys, over my here, publisher is going to be really mad. Okay. So this is a, a, a bond between us. Yes. We're going to keep this secret just Pinky between swears. us and the, you know, 
two to 6,000 people that will see eventually the video. Um, we're not gonna talk about that. Oh, but here, Catherine wants to know, Carson, what led you to write the book? Says uh, Catherine. Oh, well, thank you for asking that question. What led me to write the book was, as I mentioned before, I got very injured in my job. This was about 20 years ago before we had, you know, all the ergonomic equipment that we have in computer land. And I went from a clinical job to a very, very stressful management job. And I had two offices and they were both ergonomically very unsound. But I, did, I knew very little about it because it was 20 years ago. So I ended up getting very, very badly injured. And I mentioned it was, you know, I couldn't treat patients. I couldn't use a computer. I, I couldn't hold laundry, all those kinds of things. And I was in rehab for two years trying to get these things better. And I had carpal tunnel bilaterally, um, ulnar neuritis bilaterally, cervical disc problems. Like I was a train wreck, you guys. It was just, it was embarrassing. And, and you know, it has nothing to do with fitness because at the time I was like super buffed and working out of the gym seven days a week. I mean, it was, had nothing to do with that. It had completely to do with ergonomics. So while I was getting better, I started studying ergonomics voraciously and um, took some advanced classes and you know, got certified as, a, as an ergonomist, et cetera, et cetera. And I got back into the clinic, a different company, different job. And I started to see knitters coming in. And like, I'm not mean just like one or two knitters. I mean like boatloads of knitters were coming in. And just the same kinds of issues, like the same kind of physical problems that I had just been debilitated by for two years. And I realized, you know, these folks have the same problem that I do. They don't have the information that they need to prevent these things from happening. So I think a lot of people think the book is, is a treatment book. And there's a lot of stuff right. in there about self-care and blah, blah, blah. There's, it's there more is that a stuff. preventative book. It's more a book about prevention yeah. and, and where does risk lie in environments. And I talk about it mainly from a knitterly environment but it's very translatable. If you're not a knitter and you're a crocheter, if you're a spinner, if you're, I don't know, calligrapher, you, or sewer, any of those kinds of things, it's very, very translatable. Well, also the office stuff, like, I mean, for, for David, who's a copy editor, so he, you know, um, I showed him the section about chair height relative to desk, rel the, about the wrist position for the keyboard. Um, as a copywriter, he also has two monitors so I said, you know, which one do you look at the most? Because if they're both, if, if neither one of them are where you're looking, you know, so like I, when I'm not filming up here, cause this is, I, I have my, I have my Carson set up um, upstairs in the, in my guest bedroom, which is where I'm, I'm COVID landing right now. But when I'm not filming, I um, give all this equipment back to him. So he has my, uh -huh. uh, he has the little stand and everything. But, you know, maybe um, you should get that for his birthday. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know what kind of, he did, he, what kind of bugged me a little bit, well, I shouldn't out his, I mean, his company is so nice to him, but it was a little weird that when he requested a footstool at his office, like he, they wanted a doctor's note. And I think they just don't want like everyone just asking for, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, um, you know, his chiropractor wrote him a note saying like, oh yeah, he's yeah. five foot six and like desks aren't made for, for us. I'm five, three. And neither are chairs, neither are chairs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, where did I put this? I sometimes get my, my work documents and writing confused with my, my going knit stuff, but I just did something about chairs. Oh, I know it was, it was at work because of people working from home. So I did a, I did a little thing about how to shop for chairs. And you know what, I think, I think I will actually recreate that document and put it up on my website for people who are looking for chairs. That would be yeah. a nice thing. I mean, I actually do a whole class on it. So, but it would be nice just to have a little paper that you could take with you to the shop and, and try out. Yeah. And, you know, you all should know that uh, um, the, the big box stores, like the office depots and those kinds, they have office furniture, but it, those are sure not really, they're not generally not designed to be a task chair for computing. They're nice for meetings and kind of being kind of relaxed in. But if you are 
And certainly uh, if you're knitting in the chair, you really don't want your arms encumbered by armrests. You don't want a high back on the chair to cover your shoulders in that sort of upright positioning because you end up kind of all hunkered down. You want to be nice and open. Yeah, the, the chair that I ended up getting um, after the book only, only works for me because I'm narrow, because it does have arm, it was a chair that I got from um, the container store? No, not the container store. Maybe. I can't remember. Um, but the back height was correct. And Oh, you went to Ikea. No, 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 it wasn't Ikea. I think it was, con I think it might have been weirdly container store. Okay. Um, or... Yeah, anyway, um, and it did have, the only thing is the, it had two versions, it had one without arms, but that one didn't raise and lower. So I needed, I needed the one that raised, raised up high and it did have arms, but they're wide enough that I'm inside of them. Yeah. So for me to be on them would be more like this. Right. So I'm on a long phone call, but when I'm just working, my arms are actually inside of them. But if you were wider than me, it, it would it would not be it would not be good. Oh my God, there's so many comments. Oh, someone asked, is the trackpad like a mouse? The trackpad's like a track like um the trackpad on my laptop. Yeah, it, it's a mouse. But it, yeah, it's it a works mouse, as a mouse. It, you know, I move my little finger with it. Um, oh, Heidi said I went silent. Oh, I hope I didn't go silent too long since I didn't see that comment till now. Um, the back reminds me of the rooster on the friendly giant. What? I'm not sure what that is. Um, oh, Charlene said, your book saved my knitting. Oh, thanks, Charlene. That's I'm glad it's helpful. Oh, and Barbara said I, that she had to stop knitting due to a sore, stiff left shoulder. But I'm back now. Um, and I stop and I move my shoulder around. Yeah, the, the, that's the post-its in my book. So the post-its, um, which now I don't need the post-its because I, I, I really have them memorized from the dark days from when I was really um, struggling, when I was really in pain. And that's when, so Zena, my friend Zena, she's the one who, before this elbow issue, I had like a temporary thing, which is that I flew to California. I flew to Stitches West with my elbow, right? on the knitting the whole time. And when I got off the plane, my, my hand was numb and tingly. And so I don't think I had met you yet. And I texted my friend Zena and she's like, asked me a bunch of questions. And she's like, okay, it sounds a lot like you have ulna nerve in trap. Ulna, right. yeah. yeah. So she, she made these little videos and she texted me the like the passing the egg one back. Um, and the, um, uh, Oh, I can't now I can't remember some of them but anyway so that was before she, that was before she was even doing filmed little videos and I, I feel like her. I know I feel like I inspired her so there you go yeah. but those little short videos are so good um I uh, uh oh now I'm I'm behind oh um Sandra says my issue is my left thumb thumb hmm oh yeah there's Anything that's working, you know, depending on how you're holding the tools, what your tensioning strategy is. If you're a gripper, a death gripper. Could be a death gripper. You know what I see a lot is um, I don't have I I don't have extra mobility in my thumb. I just have sort of normal zero extension here. But there there are a lot of people who can hyperextend this joint, and when they're holding their needle, can't get my hand in a good position, but they're actually kind of hyper extending and they're really yeah. pushing. Yeah, like you, like that. Yeah, like I, that. I'm very- Really pushing it. And, and what happens is you put so much compression on the articular cartilage that it can get really um, painful. And it could actually, you know, create an arthritic condition that if you're not careful about it, you're constantly doing it. There's so many bizarre things that we do, you know, that we, we all make beautiful fabric, but sometimes it comes at such a cost and if you don't know where the risk is, you can't. You just can't make the improvements to uh, to take those forces away. And the bendier you are, like my my um my mother's an, an occupational therapist, and um, when we we're kids, we would do the weird the W sit, you know, where you're, yeah. 
Yeah. And she would always say like, oh, you, 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 all you kids are low tone, she would say to us, which is very dangerous because you're very, we're, we were all um, low tone, double jointed, extremely flexible, which um, can, you know, can do the weird, yeah, can cause. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, someone said new book. How about ergonomics of spinning? How about it? Hmm, says Grace. Uh, mm -hmm. so there. Uh, 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 oh, Chris says, I'm just starting out. So this might be a silly question. What do you guys think about knitting while walking? I do it all the, the best. best, the best, the, the best. best. Knitting is designed to be done while you're walking. And so get yourself a bag like Patty has, um, you know, whatever, and take yourself for a walk. Can I tell a really funny story about walking uh -huh. and knitting? So there's this wonderful group of friends, um, who get together, they, they live up in Moran and they get together and they host their own little retreat. And this was probably, I don't know, five or six years ago. And they invited me to be their teacher. And I was so delighted. It was up in, um, uh, up, they, they had like a redwood forest behind the house and it was just beautiful. And, and part of the class was, we're gonna take a walk to Nick. I want you guys to, I mean, who wouldn't want to go walking in the redwoods, right? So, so there's probably 10 women and me and my dog, Lily, and if you don't, those of you who don't know Lily, if you've got my book, she's on the back cover, but she's a beautiful white standard poodle who's not so beautiful at the moment because she's very, very sick and a poor girl. But anyway, she was gorgeous and in full coat and she looked amazing. And so we go out into the Redwoods to take a walk and knit. And the, the first question that anybody asks is, what do I do with my yarn? Because if you don't have a little bag like Patty's, what do you do with your yarn? Well, you can put it in your pocket or whatever, but these women, unanimously without consult, you know, without uh, consulting each other, suck it right here. So it was like, now you've got these 10 women with these bright colored balls of yarn in their cleavage, right? And so we're walking through the forest, we're having a good chat and a good knit, right? There you go, Patty, look at you. Oh, wow. You could work at Minsky's. This is 100% wool. This does not want to be in here right now. No, well, it's too hot for that now anyway. Yeah, yeah put it in your bag. So anyway, we're walking along and these two guys come jogging through the forest and, you know, they're coming up behind us and, they, and they're just seeing these, this gaggle of people and this beautiful white fluffy dog. And then they realize as they're walking through or jogging through us that some of them are knitting. And so they're jogging and they kind of like start turning around because they're seeing these balls of yarn. It was so funny. They like tripped over the roots. It's not funny that they fell, but it was kind of funny that it was hilarious. And then this um, this tourist group came through and I think they were some, uh, I think the, the tourists were from Asia and they're walking through and one of them is like, is this normal? Do you, is this something that Americans do as they put the yarn here? Anyway, yeah, you might get what, looks walking. It's what we do. But you should still do it. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to, um, when I worked at yarn stores, the, and you know, when you work in a yarn store, you do not get to knit at work. Like, cause you're just, running nonstop, such hard work. Um, so the only real knitting I would get done is walking to the subway and then knitting on the subway um, and standing on the platform. And so uh, my friend, um, my friend Francesca filmed a little like brand video for me that's that's on my website, it's not like on my YouTube channel. It's just like, she spent a couple days with me. And um, so one of the parts of the video is me standing on the subway platform knitting. And, you know, I get asked all the time, like, oh, so did you guys stage that? And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, we were spending the day together and I was taking the train somewhere, but like, that's, yeah, standing, knitting, waiting for the yeah. train, like it's the best. Yeah. yeah. There's no, 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 you know, idle time, no, you know. No idle hands. Uh, oh no, sh we should live on Freaky Geek said, oh no, we should live on a far to knit ducks in a row. Sometimes the conversation moves along and I have no idea what things mean, but. Um... <laughs> oh, oh Bar Barbara, Barbara says it's in the vault as in Elaine from Seinfeld would say about the. the it's in the vault. The Oak Bay. Um, yeah. Just, just to know, oh my God, there's so many comments. I'm so far behind. Oh, Jane says I'm only four foot nine. Um, oh. oh, so what I want to say, 
can I say something to Jane and to people who are um, not the tallest kids in class? When you're out shopping for chairs for your knitting, make sure you ask about, um, you can get different cylinders than, than what necessarily comes with it. So there are chairs that you can get um, like a 50, um, a, a four inch cylinder on, what is that? 50 millimeters, is that right? Like that. Wait, what, I don't know, um, what's the cylinder? So, so the cylinder is the thing that, that the seat gets mounted to and it's the thing that makes the chair go up and down. And they usually come like a standard size for standard height people is six inches. But if somebody your height, Patty, or certainly four foot nine, your feet would never touch the floor. So you want to, this is why the big box stores aren't a good place to go because their, their furniture isn't likely to have that. So you want to go to a place that deals in um, legitimate office furniture and ask them about shorter cylinders or taller cylinders because you can get a seven inch cylinder. Like, you know, I fit plenty of people who are over six feet tall um, into chairs. Now, well, if and, you're over seven feet tall, that's a whole other story, but. Um, well, and also the desk doable. issue. So like the, for me to get my wrist in the right position for my desk, I had to have the chair be way up, which is why I have a footstool. Yes. So there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I'm super short, gave myself an injury a few years back. Every table in the world is too tall for me. Chris says I'm 5'2 here. Gray says nothing is made in my size. Sandra says that would be great about the blog post. Um, where's there a good place for a short person's chair? So ask about the cylinder. Um, wow, there's a lot. So there's a lot of us out here <laughs> that are yeah. having this, <laughs> this same um, short person issue. Why? Yeah. Uh, are there tall people out there? Um, hold on. Let me go back and see. Uh, wow, this is this thing has more um, comments than than anybody. Um, Chris says I still sit. Oh, I still sit on my legs. <laughs> yeah, to get you high enough. Um, last three days I hiked for an hour. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, Reg Reg Eight says I just want to encourage others to keep trying. If some of the more ergonomic knitting techniques were awkward at first, I tried so many times to lower my tensioning finger before it worked. Yes, the lowering of the tension finger is where you and I are in like. Complete simpatico. Yeah, you, because number I, one, number one problem for continental knitters is um, throwers. right here. Uh, sometimes throwers, but those, yeah. those knitters who do this yeah. to tension their yarn. Because then I also see, um, so w one thing that I, after I was on a cruise, I had this epiphany. So when you're in the expensive cabin, way at the top, and you're in a storm, right? Look how much it moves. But the pivot point down here is, is hardly moving, right? It's very small. So same thing with your finger way up high with that yarn. Um, you have no control over it. So in addition to the reason that you're teaching it, which is th these large, ex you know, exaggerating movements, that's why your stitch gauge is all crazy pants. I had the most incredible experience teaching at, it was the last Madrona, um, which was two years ago now. And I had a knitter in my class who had elbow pain, Patty, kind of similar to what you were doing, but yours, I think, was more all if I can remember correctly. Anyway, Mine she was, was the, um, is the, um, the, the, this one, it's the, um, yeah, uh, epimedial condylitis. Medial epicondylitis. Me medial epicondylitis. Epimedial, I like that. Anyway, she was, she was this one, right? And, and she'd been knitting for a, a good long time. And, and she actually fix. said to me, what's that? That was the easier one to fix. Mine's the harder yeah. one to fix. Yeah, well, yeah, they can both be troublesome. It depends on where you where you jump into the rehab. But at any rate, um, she was complaining that you know she was always in pain, and she and she was really dissatisfied because her gauge was never accurate. And you know, you're absolutely right. If you can't, the whole reason that we have tension is to create consistency in our stitches. And if you can't have a consistent amount of tension, your fabric is just not going to be consistent. So she was rowing out, and you know, all all the typical stuff. Plus, she was having discomfort. So she was in a class that I was doing where um, we focused on one particular problem that each of the knitters had, and this was her problem. And so in the book, I do these things called swatch opportunities, and they're these little, um, 
little exercises that yeah. you do, not like physical exercises, but knitting exercises to improve your ergonomic technique. And so she did this one, which was just working on this, like knitting super slow, 10 minutes of practice, and she was getting gauge again. It was amazing. I know. And she, she went to her room that night and she knitted me the swatch and I carry it with me to every class so I can show people. She needed um, a swatch about yay big, what is that, four inches? Perfect tension, perfect gauge, consistent all the way through the fabric and no pain. And it was just that one little tiny thing. So you don't have to do everything, just one little thing. Right. And that's why I I love I, I, I have been teaching my Build a Better Fabric Perfector knitting class on Zoom. And I tell people like, you can hold it up to me, you can show. But it I, I do, that's the one class that I just miss teaching live because I do after, I, yes, there's certain things that I'm telling everyone. Yes, there's certain tips that I'm giving everyone, but then I do walk around and I'm, you know, and certain things come to me based on certain knitters. Like, oh, you know, I see the way, you know, you, the angle of your yarn to your needle, you want to think more about, maybe think about retracting your left needle more than, you know, exiting, whatever, like things come to me. But um, but the, the newest column that's going to come out January 20th-ish that I did for Modern Daily Knitting is all about letting your tool do the work and why, you know, when, when we're not actually using our tool as a measuring cup, why things go horribly awry. By the way, we do have some tall knitters here. So um, there were some folks posting comments, I'm 5'10", workstations at work are so uncomfortable. Yes, I'm 5'9", 5'10". Um, yeah, so there are some, so the two tall ones too. Um, and Reg said, I also wanna say that Carson's book really helped me identify why computer setup, yeah, that's me too, um, wasn't comfortable. Built an ergonomic home workstation. I still need a better footstool. I love my footstool that I got. I wish I could remember where I got it because it, it it yeah, moves. you can look at the brand. The brand name will be on on it, and I forget who makes that footstool. I should remember it, but I, I don't. Chat amongst yourselves. Um, oh God, is that a Workrite? I think Workrite makes one just like that. Um, maybe Fellows makes one like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know remember. if you can find it, but it's really handy. Um, so you have. Oh, there are so many comments here. All right, hold on. Question: When you walk and knit. At what level should you hold your work? Oh, that's a good question about yeah. the neck. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing, and this is what the this is what the blog post will be about. But always, and I know you're going to melt down, some of you. Your your elbows should always be at a right angle with your shoulders resting at your side. So your work is just like you're typing. That's where your your wrists. And Wait. Say your say, say it again. So your forearms are basically parallel to the floor or the ground if you're walking. And I know what people are thinking. How can I see what I'm doing? I will get my blog post up. But yes, your hands are way, way smarter than you give them credit for. You don't need, to, I promise you, you don't need to watch yourself make every knit stitch that you create. The miracle of birth is just once you've seen it, it's kind of all the same. That's maybe not true about actual birth, but knitting stitch birth. Um, and, and even purling. So that is actually a series of swatch opportunities in my book that walks you through learning to knit with a good neck posture so that you don't have to look down at your hands. So that doesn't mean you never look at your hands. It just means you choose when to look at your hands. So if you've got a field of, of reverse stockinette and it's time to cross the cable, you don't need to watch yourself make those purl stitches, but watch yourself make your cable. But don't you what find you also, so, Stitch oh, marker. a little stitch marker. Yeah, so yeah, of course. When my and when you're when that is passed through your hand, you're like, oh, and now I'm switching stitch, and this is pearl. So stitch markers too help you. Oh, there's a knit. Now I'm not looking down. I can feel. It. But one of the things um, in my bionic knitting classes, I make them knit without looking. Yeah. And I make them yeah. wrap the yarn differently, and then pearl back without looking, so that they can feel the face of their stitch. And, and it, get across it's a whole very world important. But those are all really, really important skills. Look at how bad my hair is, you guys. Oh my God. I, yes. I haven't had a haircut since January. Not to get guess off topic what? here, but. I haven't had a haircut since January and guess what's happening tomorrow. Oh, really? It's all coming off. Wow. Yeah, because wow. my friend's wedding on Friday. So I'm going back to Brooklyn. That's why I'm not doing Vogue this time because 
because this is auntie's wedding weekend and i'm just gonna oh really oh, that's yeah. so nice yeah hey give her give them my love I will. I'm really um fingers very. crossed it doesn't rain nervous because we're outside and it's friday and it's the only day they're predicting rain right now of course um I have an old sewing rocker, great for, sh oh, an old sewing rocker, great for my short legs. You mean the? Like a treadle? That's cool. That's basically what this footstool is, kind of. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's very much like that. That's cool. I love that. Charlotte says, I always I, I'm I a big, knitting. Oh, sorry. I'm a big fan of um, three ring binders as footrests because they're very portable. So if you like to go to a cafe and you don't want to carry that big clunky footrest, just have a a three ring binder that you can put some pattern, your patterns and charts in it or your notes. And, and if you don't need it as a footrest, it can serve as a document holder for you. Now, Charlotte said, I always thought I was knitting wrong because I hold my fingers quite close to my knitting. So do, so do, so do we. The way to do it. So do we. Uh, oh yeah, 5-8, year, you know, years of working in the wrong, ergonomically wrong environment. So, oh, uh, Deborah says, after my neck injury, I followed your suggestions to switch between larger and smaller needles and marking my pattern to take breaks. And they were a lifesaver. I can knit again. So glad. Yay. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. Oh, 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 when I retired, I revised my home office. I now have a fabulous lift desk. You mean like where you can stand? Like, like one of those? Stand desk. Yeah, those are terrific. Um, I would love to get one. I, I live in a really small apartment and, and um, half of my living space is, is dedicated to the studio, not just and, and office. So what you're seeing behind me is kind of where I, I do my writing, but what you can't see on the other side is where I have one, two, three, four fleeces over five fleeces over there and boxes of yarn and over there are you know the row of spinning wheels and blah 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 my point is i have a i have a folding table that's my work table and i'm only about five eight or five nine so i got i went to um uh bed bath and beyond and i got these things that you put under your bed to lift up your bed so that my table could be at a better work height for me you know they're just bed risers and they're like ten dollars, yeah. And they come in different heights, so you can get like four inches, six inches. Mine are probably ten inches because it was a pretty low table. But um, to the person who said they have the the um, lifting desk, that's really what I want to do. I, I really want to get an electrically adjustable desk. Well, you know, you don't if you can't get one of those fancy schmancy deals. Um, my friend's auntie has because she, she's just at an, a regular office where um, it's like one of those office shares um, where she has like a permanent desk space for her and her colleagues at her company. Um, but it's a thing that sits on her desk and, and she can, you know, like choose to raise it up and then stand or lower it back down and sit. Yeah, those are really popular now. And, um, you know, unfortunately, because so many people are working from home now, getting, getting, to actually purchase that stuff, it's all back ordered. It's really hard. Like I'm oh, at wow. my job, I'm trying to get headsets and keyboards for people who are working remotely and um, everything is back ordered. So it's, this is a tough time to be doing it. But what I'm looking that. for is a, an entire work surface because that little desk converter isn't gonna help me when I'm sorting the police or right, right, right. something like that. So I need a big work surface that I can yeah. yeah, my blocking table got me a little, got me halfway there, but you, you would still probably be displeased with it because it's definitely better for those, for those of you who have been taking my video sweater classes since the beginning, you know that in like the first few video sweater classes, my blocking videos are me crawling around on the floor, right? On my hands and knees. Now I have a blocking table, but it's an L-shaped table it's like a so it comes it's the same height as my desk so i'm still yeah. bending over more than you would probably love yeah but it's much better than being on the floor and sometimes it's you know if it's if it's appropriate as a seated height you can do your blocking sitting down i i do that sometimes yeah i like sc I, I have my chair on wheels so i sort of wheel and then around. you kind of you kind of sit with like a straddle 
a straddle, not a straddle, but a stride position so that like you're at the, I can't demonstrate here. I'm, you can't see it, but one leg forward and one leg back so that you can yeah. hip hinge to get closer or farther away from your work. Yeah. Um, I have pictures of that in my book for if you're blocking on the floor, you can get in that same kind of position to do blocking on the floor. Lily just woke up and she, you might, you guys might hear from her just warning you. It's the, it's the joy of the Zoom. Um, yeah. yeah, the, the, the thing that is the, the most ergonomically challenging for me is, um, is filming and, um, even when I teach, when I teach live at the big shows is incredibly similar to when I'm teaching on zoom, because when I'm teaching live at the big shows, I have an iPad that is pointed at my hands. That's my camera. And I'm looking down into the iPad, right? So I've tried to fix that a little bit by tipping it towards me. And so I'm looking at it a little more, but you still, to deal with the autofocus that you don't want it to go in and out. Like when I'm doing teacher training for Vogue, I say like, think of it like the tango, like you, you lock in your frame, like when you're a tango dancer. So you have to like find that, and, and same with, with like filming for Crafts or in a wave, like you have to figure out where are your hands gonna be and kind of keep them there. So, yeah. you know, when you're teaching for like hours, it can be rough, you have to like, shake it out a little bit. It's interesting that you think that knitters are gonna identify with the tango. Like how many of you out there know how to do the tango? Well, but uh, first of all, it's a te it's teacher training. It's not for that, you know, but you Well, know, even more so maybe, I don't like know. Like anyone who's ever seen So You Think You Can Dance knows about the tango frame. Oh, we do, is that a thing? I oh, never watched thing. that show. <gasps> oh, we love that show. Really? David and I love that show. We watch it all the time. Oh, oh Bed Risers Under My Dining Room Table. Okay, excellent. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, oh, Freaky Geek has to go. Bye. And actually, I have to go too. It's We've already we've already been chatting for an hour and 12 minutes, for goodness sakes. Um, I'm just catching up on... Uh, 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 I'm Continental Knitter, and I fixed my finger tension, and now I have to... But now I have tension in my wrist of my right hand. Mm. Mm. That sounds like death grippy to me. If it's your right hand. Because um, the other thing I find with continental knitters, and I don't know if you've found this, Carson, I talk about how um, with throwing, your needle stays stationary and the yarn moves, right? And with picking, your yarn stays stationary and the needle moves but it should be just the tiniest, like, boom. what I, I find that when the finger is up high, there's a lot of like excessive. It's too, when, when the finger is up high in continental just, knitting, the yarn is too long to keep the tension on. But typically what those knitters will do is they'll engage other fingers to shorten it. So when they're trying to do a purl stitch or something, right. they'll bring in their middle finger to kind of push the yarn down so they've got just a short bit to, to get a hold of. Right. But to your, to your point before that, Patty, you know, I say this to, to really all of my knitters and I'm sure it's in my book somewhere, but we design tools to work with a mobile element on a stable element in the system. And so for continental knitters, the stable element is the, is the giving needle, which is typically on the left side. So that needle stay, should stay perfectly still. The fingers should just rest against it with the working yarn kind of trapped there. And the right side, the receiving side, just picks, picks the stitches, literally picks the yarn. And the tension should be just enough that um, the yarn can move through your, through that tension point as you okay. pick. That's all the tension that you need. We are really like the same teacher. We, we kind of are. Well, and we look exactly like, like, I feel like this is separated at birth, right? Because when I talk learn. about checking your tension, I say like, try, just, just, uh, let go of your needle. Now, if you can't pull your knitting away and have the yarn just flow evenly through your fingers without it being, you know, cause like, you know, the death grippers, I'm like, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna fail yeah. on that. Cause and you'll see a lot of people who have the working yarn instead of coming towards them, oh, you know, coming this yeah, it way, goes backwards. that way, 
And so it just makes it longer and harder to manage. It's more work for you that way. Yeah. Yeah. And you have so, to reach for it. Exactly. So for British style knitters, and this is the perfect example of British knitting because British knitting traditionally was done with a belt or a sheath or a stick, which literally stabilized yes, your needle. So the needle was perfectly still and the giving side did the movement. And if you watch, you know, Shetland knitters, um, my friend Hazel, um, and and just really any of those, Name those uh, sorry, <laughs> she, she's an amazing knitter. There's so all the knitters in Shetland and I, you, you can't find a bad knitter there. <laughs> Lily, settle down there just a minute. Some of us she have never cookies. gone. L litter, she wants cookies. But anyway, well, it's going to be there and it's going to be even better. I want a cookie. You don't really want her kind though. They're no, I want her cookie. No, no, no. Settle down, please. Anyway, what was I saying? So the, the left needle does the moving and the yarn just gets thrown over and it's this shuttling, shuttling kind of movement that the left needle does. It, it, what, what you have to kind of think about is with continental knitting, the receiving side is the inserter. It goes in and it, it's the marauder. It goes in and hunts for the yarn. In British knitting, it's the mother stitch that surrenders herself to the sword. She's the one that sits down on that. She sits down on that needle and gets wrapped and then takes it up and off. And then she's you know, ready for the, the next one. Which by the way, is very similar conceptually to um, knitting backwards. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. When you're lifting the old stitch up and over the new stitch. Um, oh, uh, um, we're getting dog requests. Charlotte says, I want to see her. Um, oh. My dog is, I, is Lily and perks up every time you say Lily. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> that's so sweet. I'll try to do Lisa, this. Let me see. This is Lisa very precarious. Let me just... <laughs> Doodle, look. look. Oh, she's like, yeah, forget about it. That has been one of my favorite things about teaching for Vogue. Um, is and also teaching on my own platform when you teach live yes you get to be in the room with the knitters and that's great but when you're teaching virtually i get to have dogs and cats in the room which has been really fun you know um so two things i'll say about that first just for those of you who saw who saw lily and she doesn't look really great and it's not because i'm a bad dad she's she's dealing with liver cancer and she's sort of at the end of her days it's very sad it's very sad so the silver lining for me for COVID is that I've got to be at home with her every single day since March and that's a good thing. The other thing I want to say is, I don't know if you saw this, Patty, because I know you're a Broadway uh, person too, but um, when Stephen Sondheim had his 90th birthday celebration, they did it virtually, you know, instead of a big concert because you couldn't do the big concert okay. thing. But I have to say it was so fabulous because it was so much more intimate for these artists to be giving of themselves from their personal space. Like, I don't know, it, I'm a, you know, I am obviously a big showmo and I just love Stephen Sondheim and, and the, 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 the artists that performed for that show were just, was incredible. So if you like Broadway music, you should definitely see that if you haven't, but just to be able to see like in their homes, like, um, Foster did this really cool thing where she put like a, I think she was in her shoe closet, I don't know, and she put like this big sheet and her daughter came in, oh, it was so sweet. It was just the coolest thing. So yeah, there's this level of intimacy that can happen. As much as, you know, the, the, the new kids were great, it was the oldies that killed me. So first of all, Chip Zine killed me, absolutely killed me. Um, I, I mean, there, there are certain songs from Into the Woods that are so inextricably linked to Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. Um, they came up together, um, they, you know, for, for those of us who are old enough who have been to a lot of memorials, um, No One Is Alone became sort of the, the, the song of, of memorials. And it just had such a different it, it had such a different, um, oh, sorry, no, no, I'm, I'm uh, no more. He sang no more. And um, uh, Burnett Peters sang acapella, 
no one is alone. Sometimes yes. people leave you halfway through the woods. Do not let it grieve you. No one leaves for good. No one is alone. And she sang a cappella, and then Mandy Patinkin singing uh, Lesson 36, a cappella. Um, absolutely. It was amazing. It was an amazing event. Yeah, that, that was a great, great, great show. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and that, and I'll never hear the lyrics of No More Again without, uh, without thinking of the, of the, of this time now, of uh, hearing Chip Zine sing that, um, I remember I was, uh, I was on Twitter and, and, uh, Bristol was on, Bristol, who's a, also a big, a big Sondheim fan was like, she was live tweeting the whole thing. And I got to, um, uh, no more giants waging war. Can't we just pursue our lives with our children and our wives till that happy day arrives? How can we ignore all the witches, all the, all the, uh, uh, I just forgot it. All the, the um, oh, always wondering what's even worse is still in store. And I, I tweeted that and, and Bristol came, immediately came on. She was like, oh my God, that killed me. I'm watching it too, but yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah, there's actually lots of cool, like I, I this whole little thing, it's so much fun because I get to see a little bit of your house at Upstate, which is really cool. You wow. can see a little bit of my funky face behind me. There's there's the mess that is the actual bed. <laughs> Green <laughs> trees, oh my gosh, it's so lush. It looks so New York-y out there. It's really cool. it's It's beautiful. I, mean, I haven't been back east for six months, Patty. It's, it's kind of hard. You know, my mom is 94 and she's back there. She had a stroke in um, just after her 94th birthday. She's great. She's doing really well. She's completely recovered. But oh my goodness, it was so hard to not be able to go and be with her. And my niece, just my goddaughter, actually just had her first child in upstate New York. And her brother's wife um, had had a baby a couple months ago and I haven't met any of these kids yet. So yeah. Like, uh, hard. No, I know. I know. It's, it was really odd because, um, you know, I travel so much. I'm so used to being in and out and in and out that um, Tuesday, no, Monday night, David had to go back to Brooklyn because he had some doctor's appointments on Tuesday. And originally we were just going to like head back at the same time because auntie's wedding is Friday and we were just going to be in Brooklyn. And then, he, and then he brought up the point, like, what about all our plants? All our plants are going to die. We can't just be gone for a week. We don't have any, any wood and water because we have, you know, our tomatoes and eggplants and green beans and all the stuff we're growing. So he went, he said, I'll go on my own Monday night, I'll go to the doctor's appointment, um, then come back Tuesday night. Uh, and then we'll head back again Wednesday night. So we're leaving again tonight. But when he was getting ready to leave on Monday night, we both had this weird feeling of like, we haven't been out, not only have we not been apart, we haven't been out of each other's sight basically for five months. Cause we're both- I'll test a relationship. I mean, that has never happened. Yeah. That we're just, 24 seven, like, yeah, sometimes we're in different rooms doing our work, but I mean, and it was really weird. It was like, oh, you know, it was, it made us both a little anxious. Yeah, to be apart. Yeah. Yeah, that little separation anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was, totally a little, it was a little freaky. Um, oh, Paul's gotta go. Okay, everyone has to go. Wait, I'm just gonna catch up on, on, um, on questions before, we leave, um, oh, let's see, okay. Oh, standard puppies, uh, proves are beautiful. Um, <laughs> good girl, no cookie, <laughs> good girl. Everyone was very excited about the dog. Um, oh, it says she, she just wants your attention in a cookie and not to be on camera. <laughs> That's pretty much true. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know what? Um, she's she's so funny because when you whenever I take a photograph of her, she only will let me photograph her from the left side. She's like Barbara Streisand. She will not let me photograph her face on because it makes her nose look big. 
So it's always from the left side. It's I, so I, funny. I, I really, I, I really agree with that. Um, oh, Catherine said, Patty, for filming, what about some sort of mirror setup like they do for cooking demos? No, no, no. Mirroring and knitting is a no-no. I can't have my hands flipped. I have to see everything from real knitter's view. So not only do you have to see everything from real knitter's view, I have to see it from real knitter's view. So that's what's, that's what's a little tricky. Um, all right. I have to go because this fall video sweater class is not going to knit itself. So pretty. I mean, I've been enjoying watching you knit that online. And um, I, I mean, what's hilarious is the things that that all the things that are so complicated to design are things that no one's going to know. No one's going to know the incredible mathematical insanity of having every single size be true, but having every bit of the cable emerge from the rib. And then what about when the pocket, oh, it's like, it's nuts. It's been nuts. Um, oh, wait, one last question before we leave, because, and Eileen put it in all caps. Eileen wrote, top knitters stretches, all caps, question mark. There's so many though. I mean- No, I can give you, I'll give you the, um, I'm gonna give you the same top knitter stretches that I just did for Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'll give you those top knitter stretches. Okay. Um, so let me just try to position myself here. So um, to stretch your finger flexors, which are the muscles that are holding your needle, you're gonna pretend you're like in the Supreme, Stop in the name of love. Gently hold your fingers and gently bring them back. Feel kind of yummy. So nothing should be feeling stretched. I mean, not stretched. It should feel tearing or, or too strong. Just very gently. You just want to feel the resistance. And then if you turn your hand over, you'll get stretch more on the uh, thumb side of your finger. And you and know that, that that's, really nice. that's the one that I did all the time. Yeah. That's the one. And then you can just switch to the other hand you're already in position but switch to the other hand and then turn it over straighter elbows bigger bang for your buck once you bend your elbow you've lost some of the stretch and you now, can even do this if you're standing just resting your hand on a table how do you feel about the uh, about people like me who who then can potentially i wouldn't hyper extend it so don't hyper extend it yeah i always have to be careful about that and then the other stretch that's really um, a good one is for your wrist extensor. So all you continental knitters out there. So um, very soft fists, like you're a little I don't know, sleepwalker or something, and then drop your wrists down and then turn them out. Big yummy stretch. And then sitting up nice and tall, bring your hands behind you. Oh, I love that one. Try to get your fists together, a nice big breath. Exhale and let it out. And then the last one that I'll leave you with is um, for your carpal tunnel and it's a tendon glide exercise that's really good at getting, <clears throat> excuse me, your the flexor tendon to move through full range of motion. So you start with a flat hand, like your, I don't know, what is this, the stop sign? I guess it's the stop sign. And fingers uh, tip to the top of your palm, tip to the bottom of your palm, gentle fist and an open hand. Wait, wait, the, the fist was the fist, thumb outside? I'll do it again. Start here, fingertips to the top of your palm, then to the bottom of your palm. So this knuckle is straight, right? The end of your fingers are straight. Then a gentle fist, so it's just a fist. Oh, it is to the outside. And then open. Okay. It's like a tongue twister for your hand. Thank you so could, much. That could be like a little, this could be our little secret handshake, the knitter's handshake. <laughs> well then like people will think, you know, we're giving to like knitter power sign. Although maybe we are. So there. Deborah says, thank you for a wonderful interview. Thank you, Carson, for giving me back my knitting. I can't think of a oh, better way Deborah. to end it than on that comment. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. It's been so, great, Patty. It's nice to catch up with you. I miss you so much. I know, I miss you too. So you can check back um, all of these, all of the chat 
Uh, it takes about an hour or two for YouTube to, to upload, to like finish it and it'll upload. So when the video first goes live, it won't have live chat and it won't have subtitles. Fear not, they show up in a couple hours. Okay. All right. So and, I got to do this um, thing. People now. can contact me also through my website. And that's where obviously if you want the book, you can go through my website to get it. Ergoinit.com. And I'm going to put all of that in the well. notes underneath the video. So you, mister, text me anything um, you want me to put in there other than the stuff I know, like your Instagram, your website. I guess that's, you know, that's like where they can find everything. Yeah, that's all you need. You got it. So there's a 30 second delay here. So I always have to prep this, but you all know how we say goodbye. Um, I was I was really sick one time that I, I did it and I said it, I said it wrong, but but here we go. For those of you who know it, you're going to type it along with us. So what do we say? Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Knit on. So there we go. There we go. All right, you guys. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. I'm going to end us. Bye.